Well, good morning, folks. Thank you for joining with us uh, today, this Lord's Day, being, of course, in our calendar uh, Palm Sunday, uh, when we remember um, our Lord's, the presentation of our Lord in Jerusalem, uh, where they hailed him uh, king. And, of course, we know what happened uh, a few days later. Uh, they cried out, crucify him. Uh, and, of course, uh, that's uh, what they did to him. But thank you for joining with us this morning. Uh, we're going to make a little start and sing our first hymn. And uh, we're going to sing from Redemption Hymnal, number 145, if you're using a hymn book, 145. And I uh, will stand to sing, Hark the glad sign, the Saviour comes, the Saviour promised long. Let every heart prepare a throne and every voice a song and we'll stand to sing, please. together this morning. Of course, we want to uh, pray for our service this morning, but I also want uh, to pray for um, Margaret McGee. Uh, Margaret McGee is, she's unwell, uh, very, very sick. Uh, So we want to remember Margaret and Tom and Lucy and, uh, of course, Margaret and Tom's son, Darren, and uh, the wife as well. So let's pray together. <clears throat> Our Father, as we bow before you, uh, we are mindful of the day in question, uh, Lord, in our calendars, uh, where we remember uh, how our Lord Jesus Christ Uh, rode into Jerusalem, uh, even to uh, fulfill prophecy, uh, Lord, to present himself uh, as the the, the promised king. And uh, uh, Lord, we are mindful that there was great rejoicing uh, in that day uh, among the, the common people. Uh, And yet, Lord, we know that the religious establishment uh, were upset uh, by the cries of the people. And, uh, uh, Lord, shortly thereafter then, uh, we recognize that he was completely rejected. Uh, Lord, he was uh, 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 nailed to a cross. Uh, Lord, he was crucified, uh, even... Uh, according to the cries of the people, uh, he, uh, Lord, was uh, indeed uh, wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, Lord. Uh, they pierced him, 
uh, and uh, Lord, in so doing, uh, fulfilled Scripture again. Uh, and uh, Lord, we thank you uh, that this Jesus, uh, whom uh, was healed t- uh, to be king and whom they rejected, uh, that Lord, he is uh, King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, and uh, we rejoice uh, knowing that uh, one day he's coming soon uh, again, uh, Lord, to establish his kingdom here on earth. Uh, And uh, Lord, we thank you that during that intervening time from his death and his resurrection and his ascension even to his coming again, he has been building his uh, church. Uh, Lord, uh, many have been one for Christ. Uh, They have entered into the spiritual kingdom of God uh, through the new birth. And we rejoice in that and that, Lord, uh, we belong to that and uh, we are part of that. And, uh, And Lord, we pray that all in this place today might know the reality of that themselves. Indeed, we pray uh, that, Father, uh, uh, in this time together this morning, we might know truly that you are God, that you rule, that you reign, uh, that, Lord, you're interested in each and every one of us. You know what we're going through. Lord, you, you, you know what we're going to go through. You know what the coming days hold. Lord, there is nothing hidden from you. Uh, and Lord, we think of uh, Tom and Margaret and of Lucy and of Darren and of his wife. And Lord, you know the situation. You know how sick uh, Margaret is. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would come, uh, that you would draw nigh uh, to her, uh, that Lord, even in hospital uh, today, that uh, she might know your presence. She might know that God is with her, that he will take her through uh, these coming days and all, Lord, that these days hold, that uh, Lord, you will indeed uh, carry her uh, and comfort her, uh, and that Lord, Uh, Not only would you undertake for her, but we pray for Tom as he sits by her bedside. We think of Lucy as uh, she, Lord, would likewise uh, sit there uh, and seek to comfort, seek, Lord, uh, to help. And we think of Darren uh, and his wife. And, uh, Lord, we pray uh, for all of them. Indeed, we pray that you would even speak through this. Uh, Lord, to unsaved family members, uh, Lord, whether it be in the immediate family or, or the wider family circle, and even, Lord, uh, to, to those round about that they might all know, that they might all know that there is a God in heaven with whom we have to do, a God in heaven before whom we're going to stand, a, a, a God in heaven who will judge us for our sins if we die in them, but also a God in heaven who will welcome us home when we pass, Lord, from this scene of time uh, into eternity. So, Lord, we want to commit them to you. We want to commit uh, each and every one of us here, those, Lord, who can't be with us and aren't with us this morning. And again, Lord, you know uh, that there are uh, those who are advanced in years, uh, Lord, those who are sick, uh, who have different conditions here, Uh, And we pray for them, and we pray that they too might know the goodness of God, the grace of God, the presence of God, the love of God. Indeed, even the power of God working mightily on their behalf. And so, Lord, we want to commit each and every one ourselves here, our time together. And we pray again that you would be glorified, Lord, in our lives and even in this time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to sing again, and uh, we're going to turn to um, 177 in Redemption Hymnal, if you're using the hymn book, 177. Again, we'll stand to sing. Um, Find it here myself. Jesus was slain for me uh, at Calvary. Crowned with thorns was he at Calvary. 
Calvary. Now, you might not recognize the words, uh, but you'll, you'll, you'll know the tune. So let's stand to sing this through, please. Bibles with you this morning, and I trust, of course, you do, uh, that you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. I have to say, uh, on Wednesday evening, um, I went to our midweek meeting, rushing out the door, hoping to attend a couple of other things um, besides um, being here for our midweek meeting, and I forgot my Bible. And so I had to use my phone uh, to uh, read along with the scriptures. And uh, sometimes uh, our younger people use their phones for that, but uh, the older people can see them on their phones and they think they're, they're, they're doing something else, um, looking at something else. So I... I I had to do that. Anyway, I hope you've got your Bibles with you this morning. Uh, We're going to read uh, the first 11 verses of uh, Acts chapter 23. Commencing then to read at verse 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto or until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou white at wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Refilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, He cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. 
of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should be pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Ending our reading there. Let's bow together in a little word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again uh, for another opportunity to meet together as your people. We thank you for these lovely hymns that we have sung. Uh, And uh, Lord, we thank you for the reminder even in that last hymn that Lord, you will never forsake us. You will never leave us. We thank you for the encouragement of that. And I pray that uh, something of that might even come through in this message today. Indeed, I pray that, uh, Lord, you would own this time together, that through this time together, uh, Lord, you would speak to each and every one of us, that you would challenge us, uh, that, Lord, you would help us to deal with uh, sin, if there's sin in our lives. Uh, Lord, that you would encourage us, uh, that you would help us to uh, hold on to God, that, Lord, uh, whatever the coming days may hold for each and every one of us, we might know uh, that our God is for us and that he is with us, that he will go before us, indeed, that he will come behind us, that he will overshadow and undergird, that he is also on our right hand and on our left. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. I pray for your help. Help me to share with uh, your people, this flock, uh, this congregation this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we continue in our study of the book of Acts, I want to look at the confrontation of uh, the Apostle Paul this morning as he stood before the council, uh, the Sanhedrin. And of course, then, uh, as we bring our time to a a close, I want to think about the consolation uh, he received from the Lord Uh, later that night. Now, if you can remember uh, from last week, the chief captain, a man by the name of Claudius Lysias, he had just brought uh, Paul down to the the council, down to the Sanhedrin here, uh, to hear his cause, Paul's cause, in the hope Uh, that he might know what to charge Paul with. Uh, For he was at a loss. He didn't know uh, why the Jews had uh, become a mob, why why, what he had done to incite them into a riot. He he couldn't understand. And and so he's looking for a reason. And his his best thought here is to, uh, to, to bring him down to this council, so that they might be able to give him an answer. 
And so we begin then, first of all, this morning by looking at the confrontation of the apostle. And there's three things here that I want to share with you as we think about this confrontation. First of all, the counsel he faced. Paul stood before the Sanhedrin, or more specifically, uh, the great Sanhedrin, being the highest Jewish court in the land. It consisted of 70 men. Uh, Any former high priest that was still living, certain members of uh, the high priestly families, And the elders or the heads of the tribes or families of Israel. And then, of course, then you had um, the high priest himself who acted as its chair or, or its moderator. So you had in total 71 when you uh, add in the high priest here. And as we shall see, they didn't always see eye to eye because of theological differences. And that's still the same today, even in Christianity. People have different theological differences, and sometimes uh, there can be debates uh, as a result. Uh, And the Sadducees um, were one party uh, among the Sanhedrin, uh, and they were the, the minority But they were the most powerful group in the Sanhedrin because the high priestly families were on the whole the Sadducees. And then you had, uh, and I should say by the way as well, that they were the rationalists. Uh, They they were the liberals, uh, if we may put it that way. And we'll see more, uh, uh, or we'll see why in a moment or two. And then you had the, the, the Pharisees, the other main party uh, that uh, was in the Sanhedrin. Uh, and they were the majority uh, 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 in, the, in the Sanhedrin. They were the supernaturalists. They believed in the supernatural. Uh, they were the superlegalists. Uh, they were the ones who, who uh, uh, tried to adhere to the word of God, plus also add to the word of God their own traditions. They were the fundamentalists of the day. And they were also the body that Paul went to to get letters, written authority to, to go to Damascus to extradite any Christians he found there. And, uh, of course, to which he once belonged himself. Now, just as a little reference, you'll see that there in Acts chapter 26 and verse 10, where it talks about him uh, having uh, a right to vote, so to speak. And so you have these, the, this council that he faced, the uh, 71 men uh, in total, split into two main groups, the Sadducees uh, and the Pharisees. The group that he had gone to to get written permission to get the Christians that were in Damascus. A group that he once belonged to himself. And as such then, he may well have known a number of them personally. Especially those who were uh, Pharisees. Because Paul himself was a Pharisee and we see that in verse 6. In fact, he may have studied with some of them. Uh, when he was younger, because in all likelihood they too were students of, of, of um, no, I think I've been saying his name wrong, Gamaliel. I think so you say his name properly. Uh, but they, they too would have been students of Gamaliel, who was a Pharisee uh, and a highly esteemed teacher of the law. And so here's Paul standing before this illustrious body, the highest court in the land, some of whom he knew. And he's brought there so that Claudius Lysias can find a reason 
for all the the hassle that he has been, uh, all the hassle that he has uh, experienced in the last perhaps 24 hours or so. Then notice then, secondly, the courage he exhibited. Now, in being, instead of being intimidated by this, this august body, Paul stood before them, and we're told in verse 1, he earnestly beheld them. He earnestly beheld them. That is, he, he stared at them. With a, a look, we might say, of, of conscious integrity. He knew that he had done nothing wrong. And here he is before this body of men. And he's staring at them. He wasn't intimidated by them because he knew he hadn't done anything wrong. To put it another way, he stood nose to nose with them, eyeball to eyeball with them, and he dominated them because he was an innocent man. And then he, and then to put himself on, on equal footing with them, he boldly addressed them as men and brethren and not as the rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, which was the expected norm for it recognized their position and their authority. Now, if you were to go back to Acts chapter 4 and verse 8, and we're not going to do that, but if you were to go back there, you will see that Peter and John are standing before the Sanhedrin, and that's how they address this body of men, but not Paul. On this occasion... Paul addresses them as men and brethren to put himself on an equal footing with them because he knows he's done nothing wrong. And he wanted to establish at the very outset here that he was not in uh, deference to their authority. He was not in a situation of, we might say, of submission to them. And so he exhibited great courage standing before these men. And then look at the claim he asserted. Looking at the members of the Sanhedrin square in the eyes, he told them that he had lived in all good conscience before God up to that day. That's quite a claim, folks. To put it another way, he asserted That he hadn't broken any of their laws, for he had been a good citizen. The Greek word there for those two words, have lived. The Greek word there uh, for those two words, have lived, means to behave as a citizen. To behave as a citizen. So he's saying to them here, I haven't broken any of your laws because I have been a good citizen. Moreover, he told them that his conscience, his conscience did not condemn him of ever having broken any of their laws by which they could condemn him. And as such then, he told them that they would have to come up with a crime against him that not even God knows about, for he would have convicted him of it. And so here he is, he's standing before this body of men, this illustrious uh, 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 group of men. And he's able to stand there and, uh, and, he's, and he's courageous because he knows I haven't done a thing wrong. My conscience is clear. God hasn't convicted me of having done anything wrong. Now, of course, when we think about the conscience, our conscience, if we're not saved, is defiled by sin. Our, 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 our conscience can be seared by continual sinning. Our conscience can become evil. And as such, sin is not always a good barometer for, for things. 
But when you're born again, and your sins are forgiven, you can claim to have a clear conscience, and maybe even a good conscience. And here's Paul saying, I have a good conscience. I haven't done anything, anything by which to be condemned. And I wonder as you're seated before me this morning, do you have a good conscience? Is your conscience clear? Maybe you're conscious of something in your life. That's not right. Something you shouldn't be doing. Something you shouldn't be engaged in. If that's the case, of course, you can come to the Lord. And you can ask him to forgive you. You can ask him to cleanse you. You can ask him to renew your right spirit within you. Here's Paul making this remarkable claim before this august body. Secondly, then, notice the clash with the high priest. Again, three very simple things. I want you to notice the assault of Paul. Infuriated by his claim that he had a good conscience before God and perhaps even convicted in his own heart because of the inherent integrity of that claim. The high priest, the high priest here, commanded those that stood by Paul, possibly some of his own servants, he commanded them to smite him on the mouth, which they did with either a blow from a club or a fist. This wasn't just a, a slap in the face. The Greek word there for smite means a cudgel or to pommel. And so here's Paul standing before them. He's speaking of a good conscience. He's telling them, I haven't done anything wrong. He has the courage to stand up to these men. And the high priest, he commands one of his servants to smack him in the mouth, but not with a slap with a fist or or a club. In fact, he did so contrary to the law. For it was illegal. Illegal to smite a man who hadn't even been found guilty of a crime, never mind officially accused of ever having committed a crime that deserved a beating. As a matter of fact, it, it was in keeping with uh, his, his brutal character. For Ananias, uh, the high priest here, was one of Israel's cruelest and most corrupt priests. It has been said that he not only used violence and assassination to further his own interests, And you think he was meant to be a representative of God on earth? But he also stole for himself the tithes uh, that belonged uh, to, to the common priests. This man was not fit to hold that office. The assault of Paul. Secondly, the anger of Paul. Reading from the blow to his mouth... Paul's old man. Paul's old man came straight to the fore. That is, it it rose to the surface. For he angrily rebuked the one who had issued the command to strike him, not realizing that it was the high priest himself. Now here's a man unlike other men. A man who walked with God. A man who followed the Lord Jesus Christ. A man who lived for God. A man who was willing to lay down his life for God. And in this occasion when he is, when he is uh, hit in the face. After of course the day before where he had been beaten by the Jews to a pulp. 
Here he, he reacts angrily against the man who commanded him to be hit. His old man came to the fore. It came to the surface. Now I wonder what you would have done if you were Paul. If they did that to you. Now I know it says in the Bible that Jesus, it says that when he was refiled, he refiled not again. But here's Paul and he angrily responds to what happened to him. And whilst he might have been a super saint, he wasn't perfect. He wasn't perfect. In fact, he told him that God would smite him for his hypocrisy. And he did. In 66 AD, Ananias was brutally killed uh, by Jewish nationalists because of his pro-Roman politics. He told him that God would smite him for he had broken the law that he not only represented as a judge, but was about to use to judge Paul with. As a matter of fact, he likened him to a whitened wall. A whitened wall. Meaning that whilst he appeared to others to be righteous and just, he was as weak morally and spiritually speaking as a whitewashed wall was that had been built with bad mortar. Now, if you go to the book of Ezekiel there, chapter 10, verses 11 through to verse 16, you'll read about a wall that, that had bad mortar and was whitewashed. And if you were to lean on it, it would fall. And that's what Paul is calling this man, this high priest, who had commanded him to be, sl- uh, to be, to be smacked in the face. You look righteous, but morally you are weak, spiritually you are weak. I wonder this morning, is there any whitewashed man or woman here. I'm not talking about being blood washed now. I'm talking about maybe you are whitewashed in that you've got your suit on. You've got your shirt and tie on. You've come, you've got your hat on. You look the part. But you're not saved. Inwardly, you're rotten. Inwardly, you're corrupt. Inwardly, you're full of sin. The anger of Paul. Thirdly, the apology of Paul. Now, when Paul, now, when those that stood by Paul heard his scathing outburst, and it was a scathing outburst, they said, Rephilest thou God's high priest? Or to put it another way, shocked by his reaction, they said, how dare you talk to God's high priest like that? Well, when Paul realized that he had spoken ill of the ruler of his people, he he quickly apologized for doing so. In fact, he told them that he did not know that the man who had commanded him to be smitten was the high priest. Perhaps because he had never met Ananias before. Perhaps because he had not been wearing his official robes. Remember the Sanhedrin had been assembled at short notice. So there's a good likelihood here he was not wearing the robes that he would ordinarily have worn. Perhaps it was because he was not occupying the seat that was customarily assigned to him as the high priest. They were in the basement, we might say, of of the castle, the fort of Antonia. Antonia. And as such, then they were kind of milling around. That's the thinking here, milling around. And so the high priest was not sitting in his seat. And so Paul did not know who he was. And it might even have been because Paul 
had poor eyesight. At least that's what we think he had from Galatians. You read about that in Galatians. It might have been for two of those reasons, three of those reasons, all of those reasons. Whatever it was, he didn't know who it was. Moreover, he told them that he knew he should not have done it, for it was prohibited by the word of God. For he quoted Exodus chapter 22 and verse 28 there. And in so doing, he showed them that whilst he respected the position of the high, or should I say, he respected the position of the high priest. That does not necessarily mean that he respected the man who was the high priest. And so here's Paul. Once he realizes what he had done, he apologizes for it. Once he realizes that he had sinned, sinned by breaking God's word, he apologizes for it. And he does it straight away. He does it immediately. And as Christians... When we sin, folks, we need to keep short accounts with God. When we sin, we need to to confess it straight away. That we might be forgiven, that we might be cleansed, that we might be able to go on. When we sin against another, maybe even in the church here, we ought to say we're sorry. We ought to ask for their forgiveness as soon as we're conscious of it rather than going off and leaving them to it. Time's gone on, folks. We need to move on. Notice the conquest over the Sanhedrin. Again, three little thoughts. The perception Paul had. Now, after his clash with the high priest, Paul realized that he would never get a fair trial that day before the Sanhedrin. And so he he scanned the room. And as he scanned the room, he quickly perceived that he was standing before both groups of the, the Sanhedrin that day. Namely, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Or to put it another way, he looked around about him, and as he did so, he quickly saw that he would have to divide and conquer if he was to escape a miscarriage of justice. The perception Paul had. Secondly, the declaration Paul made. Now, in order to divide and conquer, he appealed to the Pharisees for support by crying out in the midst of the council there in verse 6, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and the resurrection I am called uh, in question. He appealed to the Pharisees to support him by reminding them that he himself was a Pharisee and appealed to the major theological difference between them and the Sadducees, namely the resurrection of the dead. You see, the Sadducees, who were the rationalists, who were the liberalists, they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Nor did they believe in angels. Nor did they believe in life after death. That the spirit lived on after death. Whereas the Pharisees, the Pharisees who were the supernaturalists, the Pharisees who were the superlegalists, the Pharisees who were the fundamentalists, they did. And again, there's many people like that even in Christendom today. People who, who profess to be Christians, but they don't believe in the supernatural. They, 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 they deny the virgin birth. They, 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 they deny hell. Uh, they, they have different theological positions from what we have. In many senses, we're the fundamentalists. Or should I say, we are the fundamentalists. Very, very quickly, folks, look at the dissension Paul caused. 
His words, of course, provoked a dissension between the Pharisees uh, and the Sadducees. His words caused them to argue among themselves. In fact, as, as things got more and more heated, the scribes who, who were Pharisees cried out in Paul's defense. Verse 9, we find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. To put that another way, as contention grew between the teachers of the law who were Pharisees, they found in, in favor of Paul. Going as far even to say that if the Spirit of Christ, remember they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. If the Spirit of Christ or an angel had appeared to him on the road to Damascus or in the temple as he claimed, and we saw that in Acts chapter 22 there, then they should follow the, the advice of uh, Gamal- uh, try and pronounce that word again, Gamaliel. They should follow his advice, namely that they should not fight against God. In fact, things got so bad that the captain who had brought Paul down to the Sanhedrin in the hope of learning what he had done to deserve death. He sent his soldiers down to take him by force from among them, for he feared that he would be torn in pieces. You see, as Paul stood there uh, in the midst, as Paul stood before him, the, Sad- the, 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 the contention, the dissension between the Sadducees and the Pharisees got so bad that some were pulling him one way and the others were pulling him the other way. And so the Romans came again to his rescue. They pulled him out of the way. And they took him back into the fort proper. And with this then I'm finished. The consolation of the Lord. And two little thoughts, very brief thoughts. The Lord comforted Paul with his presence. After all of that, after all that happened that day, that night, as Paul was in the barracks, perhaps in a cell, maybe by himself even, I I, I don't know, we're told there that the Lord stood by him. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him in the barracks, and he comforted him with his presence, for he was obviously cast down. And we get cast down, don't we? We can despair, become despondent, but he can cheer us with his presence. And sometimes his presence becomes more real Maybe in those situations that maybe we know just on an everyday, ongoing walk with him. And that's what happened here. Here's Paul in the barracks and God himself comes. Jesus Christ appears to him in a unique way, of course. And he's comforted by his Savior. Jesus knew where he was. Jesus didn't need to be told where he was. He knew where he was. Jesus knew what he was going through. Jesus knew what he had been through, what he was going through, and what he was going to go through. And he came and he comforted him with his presence. In fact, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ tells us here that he was fearful regretful and forlorn about the future. The Lord comforted his servant with his presence. And folks, on a general day today, walk with him. Remember this. 
Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And then the Lord also comforted Paul with his words. The Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must I bear witness also at Rome. He stood by Paul and he praised him for the past. Paul's witness in in Jerusalem, he might have thought to himself, Lord, I wasn't very effectual. I was in the temple. They came and they got me. And they dragged me out and and they started to beat me. And then when I was given an opportunity to speak to them uh, about you, Lord, well, uh, they, they, I, I, I didn't get to finish my message. I didn't get to finish my testimony. And then when I stood before the Sanhedrin, I didn't even get a chance, Lord, all the other to say that, that, that I had a good conscience before God and that I was here because I believed in the resurrection from the dead. Lord, I didn't really get to say too much. And yet the Lord says to him, The Lord praises him. The Lord praises him for the past. And folks, we all, of course, want to hear those words, don't we? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We all want to hear him praise us. We might not have been as effectual in this world as we would like to have been. But if we're seeking to do his will, which Paul was doing here, I'm sure he's pleased. I'm sure he's pleased. He stood by Paul and he praised him for the past. He also challenged him in the present. Be of good cheer means to be courageous be courageous Paul don't be afraid but be courageous and he also assured him of a future he told him that you're going to Rome you're going to go to Rome and he did go to Rome but it would be a long time before he would get to Rome Uh, And he would have to face other issues. And we'll see it the next next time uh, we come back to the book of Acts. There were those who conspired against him, uh, who who took a vow even, uh, that they would not eat until they had killed him. But he didn't need to worry. He didn't need to fear. Because the Lord told him, you're going to Rome. And he got to Rome. And the Romans paid for it. The Romans paid for it. And folks, here we are this morning and our time is gone. Whatever your situation is, I trust that the Lord will console you with his presence. And that he will console you with his word today as well. Be courageous, whatever you're facing. The Lord knows what you've been through. And the Lord knows what's ahead. And he has a future for you as well. And ultimately, that future is to spend eternity with him in glory. Our time's gone, folks. We're going to turn to our closing hymn. Six hundred and ninety-eight in Songs of Victory. If you're using the hymn book, six ninety-eight. O Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side, nor wander from the pathway if thou wilt be my guide. We'll stand just to sing the first. Uh, 
second and fourth. One, two, and four only, please. Father in heaven, we want to thank you again for our time together this morning. And Lord, wherever you have spoken, or whatever you have spoken about, Lord, we pray that we would act upon. And if it is simply just, Lord, to have courage, help us to be courageous. Lord, help us to Uh, indeed uh, consider our future knowing that Lord uh, this world is not our home Uh, we're simply passing through Lord apply your word we pray to every heart and mind here today in Jesus name